Coming up, loyalty or mutiny in Kansas. We track the price of ice and the rising price of power. Also this half hour, who wants to buy the Sprint Campus? Plus, is it a war on the poor or ridding the city of a public nuisance? And who wins the prize for upsetting more Kansas Cityans than anyone else this week? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, I'm Nick Haynes. It's good to have your company on this edition of Kansas City Week in Review, lifting the hood on a fast-changing week of news in this place we call home, taking you from the streets to the State House at 41 Action News, Stephen Dial, covering the political beat and important news happenings at KCTV5, Caroline Sweeney, from the Kansas City Star and the host of Up to Date on KCURFM, Steve Kraske, and political analyst, columnist, and star editorial writer, Dave Helling. Now, Kansas Governor Jeff Collier recently promised to support his Republican rival Chris Kobach in the full campaign for the state's highest office. We're going to be here. We're going to be fully supporting Chris. You all know that. But how many Republicans will follow his lead? This week, Collier's campaign chair jumps ship and endorses independent candidate Greg Orman. I'm a Republican as well, but I do not support the platform that Chris Kobach is running on. Stephen Dial, is this a sign of things to come or just, just one person not make a trend? I know uh, everyone around me has been here a little longer than me, so they might have a more educated answer. <laughs> I think we're going to have a, a couple of people that stray away. I know that they've been preaching unity. Kobach definitely has been preaching unity. He's concerned about Orman definitely siphoning votes from him. And Kelly's concerned as well. I don't think this is some huge trend that's going to happen. Caroline. Well, I, it's not just one, even though it may be the highest person kind of in the Republican Party that we're seeing leave call, Governor Collier's um, side. There have been two state senators that have already kind of looked to the Democrats to endorse them and say, I know that we are Republican, but we think the Democrats are stronger. And, and last week, we had the House Majority Leader in the Kansas uh, House of Representatives saying, uh, you need to support Chris Kobach or keep your mouth shut or there will be consequences. What would those consequences be, Steve? Well, they could be any number of things, Nick. Certainly as a, a key leader in the House, they can strip people of committee uh, seats on important committees. We've already seen that with a Johnson County uh, senator. Um, they can do other uh, things to make life difficult in terms of campaign donations and where the money comes from. So, yeah, they can do a few things that, that, that would slow that train down a little bit, I think. Is this something that Chris Kobach needs to worry about? Or St Steve Backus, a chair of the Collier campaign, isn't such a big deal here? Well, he needs to worry about where the Collier votes from the primary are going to go. That's one of the key questions of this election. And if a lot of them go to Jeff uh, or to uh, Greg Orman, uh, Nick, uh, it will be a problem for Chris Kobach. Uh, but the endorsement itself probably isn't a huge deal for this reason. In, in 2014, you may remember there was a group called Republicans for Kansas Values, largely out of Johnson County, in which a hundred prominent Republicans uh, endorsed Paul Davis for governor instead of Sam Brownback for re-election, and it didn't really, Brownback still won. So it made some difference at the margins, but it, endorsements increasingly these days seem to have less and less direct impact. They just tell you a story about discomfort with Kobach, and that's a real thing, and that's what he does need to worry about. And we've talked on the show, Nick, when you have three candidates in a race, how that changes the math, trying to predict what's going to happen going forward. What's fascinating about this race is a new poll that came out this week that showed uh, Collier, uh, Collier, Kobach and Laura Kelly, the Democrat, tied uh, roughly 38 percent each. Greg Orman down in the single digits, seven or eight percent. And if, you know, if that question, if those polls remain consistent going forward, the pressure on Orman to stay in this race at the, at the expense of perhaps electing Chris Kobach is going to become enormous. Another great storyline to watch here going forward. Now, this election always seems so far away, but advanced voting begins 47 days from 
now, even less if you're watching the weekend rebroadcast <laughs> of the show. By the way, I have the privilege of moderating the first Kansas governor's debate. You can watch that hour-long exchange presented by the Johnson County Bar Association this upcoming Wednesday night at 7 here on KCPT. Now, what is the price of ice? According to the Washington Post, if you're con Kansas congressional candidate Sharice uh, David's, it's $1.7 million. That's how much the Congressional Leadership Fund is now spending on attack ads against the Democratic nominee running to unseat Kansas 3rd District Congressman Kevin Yoder. The ads reference a brief clip from a left-wing politics broadcast in which David's claimed to support the abolition of ICE. I do, I would, I would. Now we know why Nancy Pelosi's allies have spent over 700 grand backing David's. Abolishing ICE? I do, I would, I would. Sharice Davids, open borders, amnesty, a risk we can't take. All right, Davids is now walking back that comment, but is the damage already done or does anyone care, Stephen? Well, definitely people in the Yoder camp really care and that's, they've been pushing it all along. Yesterday, the Davids camp started running ads saying that Yoder, uh, high money people from out of state are, are feeling this. On the podcast, uh, she, she, the person asked her to be clear do you support abolishing ICE? She says, I do. Well, you asked defunding, which is probably the same thing, so well, yeah. And then this ad is saying that uh, she doesn't support it. The Yoder camp is really pushing it. Um, you know, it's been hard for me and I know other reporters to, to even get a comment from Davis. Caroline. I think this is what the Yoder camp has been waiting for since we got the results of that election. You remember the day after we found out it was going to be Sharice Davids instead of Brent Welder. Yoder was already coming in saying she's not from here. Look at her voting record. Kind of weak arguments. Even though they've spliced that sentence, this is such a hot button topic. It doesn't really matter what the rest, unfortunately, what the rest of her sentence was because that I would, I would is going to stick in people's Dave minds. Helling, if you were still doing your truth checks of all of these uh, campaign commercials, how would this one rate? Well, as it turns out, Nick, I did this all the time back in the Truth Watch days because there were always uh, statements, claims, uh, quotes that campaigns used against the other side. That happens all the time. In a situation like this, this is what I used to do. I would say, this is what she said then. This is what he says about that. This is what she says now. And leave it at that. Let people make up their own minds. If you think that the immigration service is an important issue to you, it seems as if what she now says is equally important with what she might have said on a podcast several weeks ago. I will say this as a, as a tactical matter. If this race turns out to be about ICE, then she's going to lose because that's ground on which Kevin Yoder wants to play. It takes the attention away from his own voting record and his own misbehavior in office or alleged misbehavior. So she needs to get the narrative turned around in some ways back to other things if she can. But a lot of people know a lot about Kevin Yoder. He's been there for quite some time in Washington. Fewer people know much about Sharice David. So doesn't she have a lot to lose? Couldn't there be more revelations, things she said in the past that are still going to come beyond just this? Nice argument, Steve. Yes, Nick, and that's the risk that Democrats took when they nominate a first-time candidate. The entire field of Democrats this time was almost completely made up of first-time candidates. And the trick here is the problem for Sharice Davids is this is the first impression a broad swath of voters is going to get of her, and it may, may put a question in their minds. But voters also have to keep in mind that, hey, she is a first-time candidate. She might make a misstep or two. They need to look at her, the totality of her views and where she comes from before they make a final judgment. Now, while masses of attention is being paid to the dramatic political races for governor and Congress in Kansas and the United States Senate race in Missouri, don't forget, though, when you vote in November, you'll also be deciding a laundry list of ballot questions. How about seven statewide questions in Missouri, three separate medical marijuana questions? Do you want to see an increase in the minimum wage? That's on there. How about increasing the, DAC, the gas tax? You'll be deciding that, too. And do you think there should be stricter limits on the amount of campaign campaign cash and gifts your elected leaders receive, that's there also. And that doesn't even begin to account for all the local issues like a tax hike for Kansas City libraries or the seven new questions approved for the ballot this week to rejig the way Jackson County operates. You heard that right, seven questions from imposing term limits on elected officials to transferring control over the county jail 
to the sheriff's office. But Jackson County lawmakers overturned a veto from Jackson County leader Frank White to get these on the ballot this week. Why didn't Frank White want voters to decide these questions, Dave? Well, he made several arguments in his veto message. He said that the language was contradictory with the existing charter. He was upset that the term limits question is included with a raise for county legislators. He thinks those questions should have been separated. Um, the six to three majority on the legislature said, no, we think the voters can sort this out. But it is seven different questions. This week, by the way, the Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, wrote the head of the legislature asking him to remove these things from the ballot or they would oppose them. So this is going to be actually a bit controversial headed to election. Well, and let me just add that Frank White is upset, Nick, because he's losing power here yes, under these charter correct. changes. He no longer would control the county jail. The authority for that would shift to the uh, Jackson County Sheriff. That's one of the big meaty responsibilities, one of the few real responsibilities the county executive has. He doesn't want this to go through. Caroline. I just want to say, I think the jail, though, is an albatross around Frank White's neck. I, I understand it's a project that he's trying to improve, but in this election year, I think maybe trying to get rid of that for the future might be a good idea. And can I just quickly add, the jail question, Steve's exactly right. That's a huge thing. In fact, there are other changes that take some power away right. from the county executive. But that is a question. The term limit uh, uh, raise issue is a separate question. So that may come down to having voters sort of say yes, yes, no, yes, no, or whatever it turns out to be. Uh, it isn't one all-encompassing uh, one question that includes all of these things together. That's why it's going to be important and complicated for voters. The Kansas City, Missouri City Council this week takes up a measure <coughs> outlawing Kansas Cityans who throw up a sign and ask for cash on the off-ramps of highways and on our sidewalks. Some complain the proposed ordinance wages war on the poor. Backers claim most panhandlers in the metro are not homeless, but street-level hustlers. The measure is carefully worded to avoid legal challenging. The word panhandling isn't mentioned at all. Instead, it limits the amount of time pedestrians can spend in crosswalks and traffic islands. But with all of the other issues on the city council plate, from building a new airport terminal to addressing violent crime, why is this a priority now, Stephen? Well, those who support it, and um, at least six council members are co-sponsored on this bill, is because of the, they're citing 311 complaints. Panhandling is strategically not inserted in that bill language because other cities and states have attempted to do something similar and they have been basically kicked back because they said it's a violation of First Amendment rights. Um, I talked to the guy you just saw in the video, his name is Shaggy, and I asked him directly, I said, you know, people say you guys take shifts, like this is an operation, and he admitted, he said, I don't do that, but he, he admitted that that exists in Kansas City, and I think people are getting frustrated with it, and I think this group of council members thinks this is the best way to, to get them off the now, court. Now, one of the virtues of doing this program for quite some time is the fact that some of these stories, that I thought yes. we'd already covered them. Yeah, no. <laughs> Didn't the yes. City Hall already decide on an ordinance that banned panhandling in the past? Our eh? colleagues weren't here for that. Steve Kraska and I were. <laughs> <laughs> it goes way back. Sometimes stories just keep coming too. around yes. and coming around. But yes, uh, but it didn't completely end the practice, as we know, and so I think there is a concern primarily, I must say, Nick, north of the river, uh, where they have lots of on-ramps and off-ramps from interstate highways, and apparently there is concern that too many folks are standing there trying to collect money. The other uh, ordinance 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, was primarily about the plaza and people being very aggressive on the plaza asking for money. That has gone away to some degree, but this is still a concern. Now, you were tracking this on Up to Date this week, too, with yes. backers and uh, critics. Well, the latest news here, Nick, is that the City Council a committee heard it yesterday. They're going to go back to the drawing board and start all over again or something close to that because there just simply isn't an easy path forward given the legal ramifications here, the First Amendment issues that are so closely connected here. If Kansas City uh, are expecting a quick and easy new law here, don't hold your breath, folks, because it might be a while. Now, this push came, by the way, in the same week that the mayor launches a new initiative on race and equity during a town hall at the Kaufman Foundation. Whether you're white, black, purple or green, whether you're rich or poor, everybody is poor until the lowest get richer. How do the mayor's words then fit with the council's efforts to what some people believe is criminalizing poor, homeless or mentally ill Kansas City and scraping for pennies on the side of the road? Steve? 
Well, you know, the mayor is, has been in a, a tough spot, I, I think, with, that we've been talking about recently with him trying to pass uh, pre-K, and now that's <clears throat> been kicked down the road. Now he's talking about uh, inequality and poverty. Um, you know, I listened to the, the, the spirited conversation that council had yesterday, and the, the tone that I got from him was that the mayor kind of just seems kind of pissed or ticked off with a, a lot of his colleagues. And so I think he's been kind of separating himself um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think he's been separating himself as getting frustrated with him kind of being in his last couple of months and just focusing on, on things that he really wants to focus it's on. It's difficult for me to always know who writes the editorials in the star, but one this morning said, well... I write the good ones. You write the good ones. So <laughs> I don't know which one to do this is, ladies and gentlemen. You can decide. Uh, but about Sly James deciding to take on this issue at the very end of his term when it's going to be very difficult to move some of these things forward when it comes to race and equity issues. Well, that's true. Uh, but uh, a conversation about race in Kansas City will go on far beyond the mayor's term, uh, term, uh, terms. And and predates his election. I mean, this has been a problem. I mean, we just went through, and Ch Channel 41 did a great job uh, on the 1968 riots in Kansas City. Those were 50 years ago. Race was an issue then. So the mayor is to be congratulated to some degree for bringing this up. But the conversation will have to extend beyond his time in office and it has to extend beyond panhandling. It's not just about panhandling. It's about jobs, opportunity, education, health care, uh, life expectancy on the east side, the housing stock, affordability. I mean, you just go down the list. That, those are tough problems to solve. The next council and mayor will have to take it up Steve. as well. You know, the mayor is exactly the right person to lead a conversation on race. He should be congratulated for leading it. The question in my mind always, uh, Nick, is how do you reach people in these conversations who uh, are, are, are who struggle with racial views and attitudes. The people who show up at these meetings tend to be people who are generally try to be open-minded and, and believe they're not, uh, don't hold strong racist views. How do you get out in the community and reach people who struggle with those questions? That's what the mayor needs to wrestle with and really everybody else who tries to tackle this issue. Just a little bit in quickly. For years, we've talked about Troost as the dividing line in Kansas City. Troost is actually undergoing an, an, an incredible it's rebirth. Changing. It's yeah. changing dramatically. And some people applaud that. Some, however, are worried about gentrification problems and pushing out poorer people further east. I mean, those are important, serious, difficult, interesting questions, political and social questions, that the next mayor and council will really have to deal with. Again, the mayor has started that conversation, but he won't end it. More than 36,000 Kansas Cityans were left without power this week as strong storms ripped through the area, downing <clears throat> trees, damaging roofs, and bringing down power lines. Meanwhile, 56,000 people and growing have now signed a local online petition questioning the rising cost of electric bills. It's directed at the Metro's largest provider, Kansas City Power & Light. Those signing it say they want an audit of the utility amid concerns of price gouging. Thousands of KC Pennell customers say they're faced with choices over feeding their families or paying for electric. But it's not just electric customers. In the last few months, Kansas Cityans have also been lashing out at the water department. Kansas City water rates have more than doubled since 2009, and there is no sign the increases will stop or even slow in the near future. But when it comes to the power companies, do we have any power, Caroline? Well, I think Kansas Cityans are trying to take some of that power back. I was with uh, Representative Emanuel Cleaver about 24 hours after that change.org petition was put up asking him to step in to do something. And by that point, thousands of people had already put their name on this petition. So they're asking for someone more powerful than them to help get that power back. But I think right now it's going to come down to looking at the two commissions in both Kansas and Missouri, lodging those complaints formally, stepping up and having their voices heard when it comes time for both for this company to be audited. And KCPNL right now, they feel like they're in a good footing. Even, I mean, right now they're asking for an increase. Uh, the statement that we got from them recently was this is, uh, we really didn't have a cold point. Uh, we didn't really have a spring. It just instantly got really hot. And they said it was the hottest June, I believe, in uh, more than, years. yeah, in a, in, in a while. And so they feel that they have a good footing to say, we're not gouging you. It's hot until you're running your air more. But people are asking for an audit of KCPNL. But you're not going to have the Missouri State Auditor. Are they allowed even to audit 
a private company? You know, I don't think so, Nick, but there are certainly other ways to take a real hard look at what the utility company wants to do here. There's the you know, Missouri Public Service Commission, there's the Kansas Corporation Commission, and these are governmental entities designed to take a real hard look at what these requests are all about. You know, the really tough news here, Nick, it, it's difficult to hear about price increases to this magnitude, but fixing these things are, are expensive. The water sewage problem in Kansas City, the effort to quit dumping raw sewage into Brush Creek or the Missouri River, fixing that problem is a multi-billion dollar problem. And I think the country is coming to grips with this notion with global warming that making these changes, fixing these problems are enormously yeah, expensive. Climate change is an important part of that equation, Nick, because it's going to be hotter, it's going to be drier, and these are monopoly institutions. The water service, the electric service has no competition. That's why you have over site by public service commissions and people will increasingly say why do you deserve the increases that you seek? Now, this problem was involved with monthly billing practices and averaging and, right. and trying to catch people up, and that's a little more complicated. But the idea that utilities are going to want more money for what they do in an era of climate change is upon us, and that will make it a major political issue going forward. Did you see this one coming? The head of Sprint says the wireless company is now exploring selling its Overland Park campus, a shrinking workforce means the wireless company now takes up less than half the space on its sprawling campus. Under the sale, the company would lease back the space it needs for its remaining employees. While it sounds dramatic, companies do change and evolve all of the time. Does it matter that it would not be the Sprint campus anymore? Caroline? I remember when this campus was built. I grew up at 119th, right in that area, and there was some concern that at that point in 1999, it was already too big. It was already taking up too much space, and we were concerned, what is it going to look like 10, 20, years down the line and now we know I don't think it's so concerning that there's going to be open space because open space is a um, it's something that people want right now and I know there are businesses that would probably fill it but the fact that it was allowed to go forward in the first place this massive campus has people concerned but the company and you were reporting on this when they were announcing a merger with T-Mobile said they were actually not going to lose jobs they were going to create jobs every single day if that's the case why do they need to actually lose space they should be building onto the campus right, right. and they have already been already we you know multiple stations have reported that they were already selling buildings and this is just more and that memo they kept Try uh, going home saying Kansas City will always support Kansas City. They said whether we were T-Mobile, whether we have a campus or not, we're always with Kansas City. So it's interesting to see the dynamic of everyone knows this merger could mean a lot of jobs lost from our area, but they're saying they're committed to Kansas City. You know, the physical setting of Sprint is an important psychological uh, notion for, I think, our community. But organized labor came out this week, Nick, and said something very interesting, and that is they suggest this proposed merger could cost 28,000 jobs, including four and a half thousand jobs at the two wireless companies headquarters obviously one of those being here in Overland Park it's that loss of jobs I think that is equally concerning if not more concerning here while many of us still can't quite come to terms with the fact that there's no such thing as Kemper Arena anymore, the new revamped Hy-Vee Arena is now just days away from welcoming its first visitors. Did you see these images inside of the slick new basketball and volleyball courts? It's not quite done yet, but officials are promising it will be as the revamped venue hosts its first pickleball tournament September 21st. The Kansas City Council sold Kemper to developers for just a dollar 18 months ago. Does this $39 million overhaul amount to a fair exchange, Caroline? I think it does. Look, Kemper Arena down in the West Bottoms, that was a big thing. That's where Kansas City started. But having this on the city's books was not good. So getting rid of it, giving someone else the opportunity to develop it and hopefully continue the development down there, I think was a fair exchange. Dave. Yeah, I think we're all hoping that it succeeds. Whether it will or not is another question. Uh, you know, youth sports is important, but whether it includes pickleball and basketball <laughs> is perhaps an open question. Uh, I was chatting with Steve Bockrath the other day uh, at the Star about the fate of the American Royal Complex, uh, uh, quite apart from Kemper itself. You know, if the Royal moves west, uh, when it moves west. west 
uh, what happens to the Hale Arena? What happens to those offices? Does the city tear those down? Do they find some other use? Do the Fouch brothers uh, use it as part of this complex? It isn't clear. So uh, the fate of that part of Kansas City, the, uh, the uh, West Bottoms, is an important, interesting question. This will go a long way in telling us whether it has a future or not. The potential here is enormous, Nick. The number of people coming down to Kemper Arena on the weekends now is going to skyrocket, and that offers all kinds of possibilities for those who want to develop around that area. Now, believe it or not, for all my attention on tackling big political and public policy stories, many of us are more enchanted about finding out a new restaurant is moving into town or the latest exploits on a sports field. With that in mind, which was the biggest story that transcended politics in our metro this week? Was it the news that after months of hype, Shake Shack is finally opening on Thursday on the Country Club Plaza? Was it the launch of the city's nine-week celebration of the arts known as Open Spaces, what its backers claim will create worldwide buzz about Kansas City? Or was it news from the Chiefs that party time is coming to an end, team officials upsetting many fans as they announce a new policy cutting off tailgating when the game starts? Or was it option D, something completely different, Steve? Well, I'm sort of into open spaces. I think this could be a really dramatic new chapter for the Kansas City art scene. The other development, Nick, you didn't mention, the opening of a new bookstore in, in the River Market, Our Daily Nada. Helen and I are going down to get some coffee down there. So, Caroline days. Sweeney. <laughs> Mine's open spaces as well. I think this is incredible. I love the idea that people can book up their weekends with something fun to do. But I would just like to say, Winstead's forever. I'm sorry, Shake Shack. <laughs> Stephen Dial. The Shake Shack might be a little, I'm not going to comment. Uh, I, I think the, the Chiefs tailgating stole the headlines, in my opinion, this week because everyone, there's a lot of new energy around the new quarterback, and then you tell people you got to either go in the game or leave, it might, it might, it might, might see less work. cars. Okay, yeah. Dave Helling. I would say that politics transcends all of these issues. Let's just be clear on that. Because there were politics involved in all three of the things you mentioned. There were politics involved in the Chiefs uh, 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 tailgating things. Some people were critical of that. People think Shake Shack has put their seats too far into the sidewalk. That's going to be an issue going forward. So politics is always a Nothing part of what it, and, and, and of course, he's keeping himself a job. That is <laughs> there we go. You, uh, thanks to our news reviewers from KCTV5, Caroline Sweeney and the stars Dave Helling. Keeping you up to date weekdays at 11 on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske, and from 41 Action News reporter Stephen Dial. Next week, we have no show, but a double heaping helping of Nick Haynes Wednesday night at 7 as we bring you the first Kansas governor's debate from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your holiday weekend with us.